You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, wherever you get podcasts. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Scribner, publisher of Hymns of the Republic, the story of the final year of the American Civil War, by Pulitzer Prize finalist S.C. Gwynn. If Gwynn's name seems familiar to you, it might just be because we've previously recommended his biography of Stonewall Jackson, Rebel Yell. Here, with his new book, Hymns of the Republic, Gwynn has put together another home run, this one looking at the fourth and final year of the Civil War. One of our favorite authors, Sebastian Younger, says, S.C. Gwynn's riveting book, Hymns of the Republic, finally made me realize that one cannot fully understand America without understanding the American Civil War. Well, we agree with that. And since it's going to be a while before we get to the war's final year here on the podcast, you can satisfy yourself with Gwyn's book in the meantime. Hymns of the Republic is on sale now in hardcover, ebook, or audiobook, so get your copy today. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 305 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. Major Henry McClellan should have had a quiet afternoon, even though at dawn on June 9, 1863, the enemy had crossed the Rappahannock River at Beverly Ford and launched a surprise attack on Jeb Stuart's Confederate cavalry near Brandy Station, Virginia. Caught completely by surprise, Stuart had nevertheless reacted quickly, ordering his troopers out of their camps to deal with the threat, while assigning McClellan to remain behind at Cavalry Division headquarters on Fleetwood Hill. Untroubled by a report that the Federals had also crossed the Rappahannock several miles downriver at Kelly's Ford, Stuart continued to direct the fighting going on around St. James Church. Meanwhile, back at headquarters, McClellan, as the recently appointed Assistant Adjutant General of Stuart's Cavalry Division, expected to have little more to do than coordinate and relay messages from mounted couriers. However, all of that changed in an instant when McClellan turned to see several thousand Union horsemen bearing down on Fleetwood Hill. To say that the Major was astonished and shocked at the sight of the enemy would be an understatement. The startled adjutant was nearly alone there at headquarters, so he knew he had to act fast, because if the enemy captured the hill he was standing on, it would put them squarely in the rear of the Confederate forces fighting at St. James Church. As y'all recall, we ended the last show with a courier galloping up to Jeb Stewart at St. James Church shortly before noon with a message from McClellan. The courier breathlessly announced that a federal column was just then approaching Brandy Station in Stewart's rear. Not quite believing his ears, Stewart ordered one of his officers to, quote, ride back there and see what all that foolishness is about. Hardly had the man set off, though, before another courier from McClellan rode up. It was Frank Dean, one of Stuart's most trusted riders. 
Now reining up in front of Jeb, Dean shouted, General, the Yankees are at Brandy. One of Stewart's staff officers, Frank Robertson, would never forget the moment the second courier rushed up with the news the Federals were in the Confederate rear. Robertson would state that in all the time he served with Stewart, the only instance, quote, that he seemed rattled was when Frank Dean, one of his couriers, dashed up and told him the Yankees were at Brandy Station. This was startling indeed. Recovering quickly from his shock, Stewart immediately ordered two of Grumble Jones' units, the 12th Virginia and the 35th Battalion of Virginia Cavalry, to withdraw from the St. James Church fight and gallop for Fleetwood Hill. Now fully realizing the danger he was in, Stewart then sent an urgent message to Wade Hampton, telling him to pull his brigade out of line and also rush back to Fleetwood. Recognizing that the fight for Fleetwood would decide the battle, Stewart then ordered Grumble Jones to send the rest of his brigade to join the fight for the critical piece of high ground. Stewart left the rebel sharpshooters behind to keep the heads of the Federal infantry down, and he also left Rooney Lee's brigade behind to occupy John Buford's Union horsemen, but Jeb rushed everyone else back toward Fleetwood Hill. The question now was, would his quick thinking and prompt response be enough to save his command? At Fleetwood Hill, Major McClellan had been manning cavalry headquarters virtually alone, except for a handful of other staff officers and orderlies, and a few couriers. However, when the Federal Cavalry unexpectedly appeared, there just happened to be one Rebel artillery piece on hand. That lone gun was commanded by Lieutenant John Carter, who was known as Tuck. Now, Tuck Carter happened to be in the right place at the right time because he'd used up almost all of his ammunition in the fight for St. James Church and then pulled back to Fleetwood Hill to refill his limber chest. And in case you've been wondering about Henry McClellan's last name, well, yes, he is related to Little Mac. Major McClellan of the Confederate Army was a transplanted Philadelphian, and he was a first cousin of the Union's Major General George B. McClellan. Stephen Sears writes that when Henry McClellan saw the head of a column of enemy cavalry approaching Fleetwood Hill, he, quote, could not understand how the Federals had evaded Beverly Robertson's brigade, which Stewart had earlier charged with guarding the downriver crossings, especially Kelly's Ford. But General Robertson, it seemed, was exceedingly literal-minded. As ordered, he had posted his command, some 1,500 men, on the direct route from Kelly's Ford to Brandy Station. When the Federals took a more roundabout route, Robertson duly reported that fact and stayed right where he was while two divisions of Yankee cavalry marched past without the least hindrance. Major McClellan was the highest-ranking Confederate officer on Fleetwood Hill when the Yankee cavalry unexpectedly expectedly appeared, and fortunately for Jeb Stewart, the quick-thinking adjutant sprang into action. He sent those two couriers dashing off to alert Stuart to the danger, and he also had Lieutenant Carter bring his gun over. Tuck Carter said he had only a few shells in his limber, but McClellan, knowing it was critically important to buy a few precious minutes for reinforcements to arrive on the scene, ordered Carter to open fire on the rapidly approaching Federal horsemen. The Federal horsemen Major McClellan saw overrunning Brandy Station and heading for Fleetwood Hill belonged to David Gregg's division. As you guys will recall, while John Buford's division was to cross the Rappahannock upriver at Beverly Ford, Gregg and Alfred Duffy were to cross several miles downriver at Kelly's Ford. While Duffy's division went off to Stevensburg to secure the operation's southern flank, Gregg and Buford were supposed to link up at Brandy Station before proceeding on to Culpeper Courthouse, 
where they expected to do battle with the Confederate cavalry gathered there. But, as we mentioned in the last show, the left wing of the Federal operation was badly delayed when Duffy was misdirected on his approach march to the Rappahannock, and so by the time he and Gregg were finally across the river at Kelly's Ford, Buford's right wing had been carrying on the fight alone for hours up at St. James Church. However, the delay of the left wing in crossing the river wasn't the only wrench that had been thrown into the Federal plans since reports had placed the rebel horsemen at Culpeper. But in reality, Buford's right wing had hit fierce Confederate resistance almost immediately. And so, rather than riding to Brandy Station to link up with Craig, Buford's advance had stalled out in the vicinity of St. James Church. Now, though, Craig's division was at last going to join the battle. After finally crossing the river at Kelly's Ford, Duffy's troopers headed for Stevensburg while Gregg's horsemen turned up the road leading to Brandy Station. The Union horsemen pushed ahead quickly since they could clearly hear the sound of fighting from the direction of Buford's right wing. Gregg's advance was led by the brigade of Sir Percy Wyndham. Wyndham was a British soldier of fortune and one of the most colorful figures in the Federal Army. He had been knighted for his service in Italy with Garibaldi. He sported spectacular waxed mustaches, and he had a chest full of medals from various European armies. Now, as Wyndham's men rode toward Fleetwood Hill, Lieutenant Carter's lone Confederate cannon roared into action. It was pure bluff, of course, but nonetheless the few shells lobbed toward them by Carter's gun made all the difference. The cannon fire created confusion in the Federal ranks and caused Wyndham to call a halt to evaluate the threat. He decided to bring up his own artillery from the rear of the column for counter-battery fire and, under Gregg's supervision, began deploying his brigade for an assault on Fleetwood Hill. When Wyndham was ready, he led the Federal advance toward Fleetwood Hill at the head of his old regiment, the 1st New Jersey. On the Confederate side, by now, Tuck Carter had run out of ammunition, and he was withdrawing his gun. The Yankee horsemen were only 50 yards away, but Carter's stand had delayed the Federals just long enough for help to arrive, as at that very moment, just in the nick of time, the 12th Virginia rushed up to Fleetwood Hill. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I'd like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. 
Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. As y'all recall, the 12th Virginia and the 35th Virginia Battalion had been dispatched at the gallop by Stuart. When the first of the Virginians raced up and then over the top of Fleetwood Hill, they found the nearest Federal horsemen were just 50 yards away. The rebels never paused, but charged on and slammed into the first New Jersey, and a wild melee ensued. The hasty Confederate charge was desperate and disorganized, but it won just enough time for reinforcing regiments under Wade Hampton to reach Fleetwood Hill. As both sides poured more men into the fight, it became a ferocious battle for the high ground, as in swirling, choking clouds of dust, Yankee and rebel horsemen blazed away with revolvers or slashed with sabers. Knots of slashing, firing cavalrymen covered the hill and its slopes. A Georgia trooper recalled how, quote, thousands of flashing sabers streamed in the sunlight. The rattle of carbines and pistols mingled with the roar of cannon. Armed men wearing the blue and the gray became mixed in confusion. The surging ranks swayed up and down the sides of Fleetwood Hill, and dense clouds of smoke and dust rose as a curtain to cover the the tumultuous and bloody scene. A New York cavalryman sought to describe the chaotic nature of the clash, writing, The most desperate and extensive fighting ensued that I ever dreamed of. Charge after charge, retreat and advance, rally and scatter, clubbing, cutting, with pistol, carbine, and saber. Batteries of artillery were taken and retaken on either side, till in amidst the surging masses, the ground was strewn for acres around with dead and wounded. The fight for Fleetwood ebbed and flowed for hours, with each side alternately gaining and losing advantage. But by mid-afternoon, the tide of battle turned against the Federals. That's because the Confederates finally managed to drive the Yankees off the heights. As the tide of battle turned against him, David Gregg, on the Federal side, had no reserves left, and it didn't appear that either Duffy or Buford was about to join him to carry on the fight for the hill. And so, with his attack on the heights having run out of steam, Gregg decided to pull back and regroup about a mile south of the railroad tracks, just out of range of the Rebel Cannon up on Fleetwood Hill. When Jeb Stewart hastily pulled Grumble Jones and Wade Hampton away from the St. James Church sector of the battlefield and sent them off to defend Fleetwood Hill, This development breathed new life into John Buford's stalled advance, as Buford began to put pressure on Rooney Lee, whom, as you'll recall, Stewart had left behind to keep an eye on Buford. Pleasanton had ordered Buford to remain on the defensive, but the tough Kentuckian was losing a steady stream of men to fire from some of Rooney Lee's Confederates who were hunkered down behind a stone fence, and Buford decided to do something about it. The Federal supporting infantry got into the action here when Buford said to some officers from the 2nd Massachusetts and 3rd Wisconsin, Do you see those people down there? They've got to be driven out. The Union infantry officers could see rebel sharpshooters and dismounted Confederate cavalrymen well positioned behind the stout stone fence and thought the enemy force there was double their own numbers. Someone said as much to Buford, who replied, Well, I didn't order you, but if you can flank them, go in and drive them off. After that, with their pride at stake, several companies from the two Union infantry regiments eased their way toward the rebels' northern flank, using whatever cover they could find, and managed to get close to the enemy. The Federals opened fire, but their shots failed to drive the Confederates away, and the Rebels' heavy return fire forced the Yankees to scramble back to safety. Buford now ordered in his battered 6th Pennsylvania and 2nd U.S. Cavalry. 
Lashed by Confederate rifle and artillery fire, the Pennsylvanians did well until slammed into by the 9th Virginia Cavalry. In the whirling fight that ensued, the 6th Pennsylvania was shoved back until the 2nd U.S., led by Captain Wesley Merritt, entered the fray, driving into the flank of the Virginians and chasing them back over U Ridge, west of the stone fence. Then Rooney Lee counterattacked with several regiments, driving the Yankees off U Ridge and back to their own lines. In the confusion, Merritt and an aide approached a group of Confederate officers and told the highest ranking of them that he was a prisoner. The rebel officer happened to be Rooney Lee, who took a swing at Merritt's head with his sword. Merritt managed to parry most of the blow, although he lost his hat and suffered a slight wound. Both Merritt and his aide managed to escape a volley of pistol shots as they galloped to safety, but Rooney Lee wasn't as lucky. He was wounded in the leg in the fighting around U Ridge. While recuperating at the Hanover County home of one of his wife's relatives, Lee was captured and held as a prisoner for nine months, first at Fort Monroe down at the tip of the peninsula, and then he was shipped to Fort Lafayette in New York Harbor. Alfred Pleasanton had had enough. From his headquarters near St. James Church, the Federal Cavalry Chief was well aware of how badly his operation had come undone. Needless to say, the Union horsemen were not going to be galloping into Culpeper that day, so Pleasanton decided to call it quits and retreat back across the Rappahannock. Pleasanton issued orders for Buford and Gregg to pull back to the river crossings, and Jeb Stuart was content to let the Yankees go, not least because his men were dazed and exhausted, and because the presence of Union infantry made a rebel cavalry pursuit a highly risky proposition. At any rate, by 9 p.m. that night, the Federals had completed their withdrawal and were back on their side of the Rappahannock. Despite enduring more than 12 hours of bloody fighting and leaving the fields to the enemy, the Federal troopers were exhilarated. For an entire day, Union cavalry had slugged it out with the famed rebel horsemen and had given as good as they got. Morale soared among the Federal cavalry units. Colonel Thomas Devon spoke with pride of his troopers' performance, saying, quote, They never wavered, but stood to the work like veterans. The Federal horsemen had performed admirably in exceedingly difficult circumstances, especially Buford's command, which carried the brunt of the fighting, going it largely alone for a good portion of the day. Truly, this was no longer the Federal cavalry of the first two years of the war, who had been hopelessly outmatched by Jeb Stuart and his Southern horsemen and for their part the Confederates gave due credit to their adversaries. A Virginian, with a healthy dollop of sarcasm, nevertheless admitted, quote, At long last, the enemy finally learned how to ride their horses. Stephen Sears writes that, quote, Pleasanton characteristically set about transmuting his role at Brandy Station from lead into gold. As he would later tell it in various quarters, instead of launching an attack to break up Stuart's cavalry, his Rappahannock crossing was actually a reconnaissance in force to find out what the enemy was planning. Pleasanton's changing of his mission, after the fact, was obviously an attempt on his part to evade the truth, which was that he'd completely failed to carry out the actual task that Hooker had given him which, as you guys will recall, was to disperse and destroy the rebel cavalry. After Gettysburg, Pleasanton went so far as to claim that he'd captured Stuart's headquarters and important papers, which, along with a supposed sighting of a trainload of Confederate infantry, was evidence that he'd discovered Lee's plan for invading Pennsylvania. This, of course, was all hogwash. Having driven off the Yankees and having been left in possession of the field of battle, 
Jeb Stewart, for his part, not surprisingly, claimed a victory. However, the Southern press took a rather different view of the matter. The Charleston Mercury focused on the fact that Stewart had received a, quote, ugly surprise at Brandy Station. The Richmond Inquirer declared that, quote, General Stewart has suffered no little in public estimation by the late enterprises of the enemy. Then the Richmond Examiner spoke of the, quote, unquote, puffed up cavalry and said that the Confederate horsemen were suffering the, quote, consequences of negligence and bad management. Such harsh criticism stung the proud Stuart, who up to this point had been the darling of the Southern press. Confederate infantry commander Dorsey Pender took a more philosophical view of the matter, though, writing to his wife, I suppose it is all right that Stuart should get all the blame, for when anything handsome is done, he gets all the credit. Although Jeb Stuart allowed his command to be inexcusably surprised on June 9th, the Confederate cavalry itself, for the most part, fought superbly at Brandy Station. Even after the Yankees got the jump on them, the rebel horsemen were equal to the crisis and prevented the Federals from fulfilling their mission that day. Grumble Jones and Wade Hampton's brigades fought especially well, as they had to hold off the Federals at both St. James Church and again at Fleetwood Hill. When all was said and done, though, Jeb Stewart was lucky, very lucky, that the Yankees' delay at Kelly's Ford allowed him to fight Buford first and then Gregg, rather than facing the two enemy wings simultaneously, attacking him from front and rear. Brandy Station is on record as the single largest cavalry battle ever fought on the North American continent. On the Federal side, there were almost 8,000 horsemen joined by about 3,000 infantry, giving Pleasanton a grand total of almost 11,000 total troops engaged. Of those, the Federals suffered 869 casualties. On the Confederate side, Jeb Stewart had around 10,300 men engaged and suffered about 580 dead, wounded, and missing. The severity of the fighting at Brandy Station impressed all those involved. In his excellent book on the battle, Eric Wittenberg points out, quote, Just a few months earlier, the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Corps wouldn't have been able to sustain such intense, large-scale combat, and Brandy Station represented a quantum leap forward for the Federal horsemen. As Henry McClellan later wrote, This battle made the Federal Cavalry. The fact is that up to June 9, 1863, the Confederate cavalry did have its own way, and the record of their success becomes almost monotonous. But after that time, we held our ground only by hard fighting. Another Confederate, a trooper in the 6th Virginia, admitted, quote, in this battle, the Federal cavalry fought with great gallantry, and they exhibited marked and wonderful improvement in skill, confidence, and tenacity. Despite being the war's biggest cavalry battle, in the grand scheme of things, Brandy Station actually didn't have much, if any, impact on the outcome of the Gettysburg Campaign. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, the Confederate cavalry spent several days in place at Brandy Station, licking its wounds and regrouping for the coming campaign. But Robert E. Lee, meanwhile, was wasting no time. According to Lee's timetable, the rebel infantry, who had arrived at Culpeper after leaving Fredericksburg, had been scheduled to resume their march on June 9th. The goings-on at Brandy Station delayed that by just a day. And so on Wednesday afternoon, June 10th, the lead elements of Ewell's Corps stepped off, heading for the Shenandoah Valley.
That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Brandy Station, 1863, First Step Towards Gettysburg by Dan Beatty. This is a title in Osprey Publishing's campaign series. We're big fans of this series, when it's done well, that is. Since truth be told, there are some real stinkers in the series. But no worries, we're here to let you know that Brandy Station is one of the better books in the campaign series. You can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find information on joining the Strawfoot Brigade over on Patreon, just like Jared, Randall, and Matt B. And Chris, John, and Sebastian. And Owen, AJ, Justin, and Mike M. We also want to say thank you to Gerard W. for his donation. Yep, thank you, one and all. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope that you'll join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey everyone, just a reminder that this episode of the podcast was sponsored by Scribner, publisher of Hymns of the Republic, The Story of the Final Year of the American Civil War by Pulitzer Prize finalist S.C. Gwynn. We're happy to team up with Scribner to promote this excellent book, which looks at the pivotal events during the fourth and final year of the Civil War. We enjoyed Hymns of the Republic just as much as the author's excellent biography of Stonewall Jackson, Rebel Yell. Hymns of the Republic is on sale now in hardcover, ebook, or audiobook. Pick up your copy today.